Many people struggle with the Bible. They know the Bible is valuable, they know it's important, but they're not sure where to start, they get stuck somewhere in the middle, and as a result, they end up missing out on the life-changing power of God's Word. And Scripture is full of all kinds of stories that tell this one story. God is a rescuer. God is a redeemer. God is a provider. God is a deliverer. Hey, man, if you're joining us on the other side of the screen, we want to say a special good morning to you guys as well. Hey, wasn't it great having Ryan and Kimberly and that team here today? It's awesome, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just uh, so grateful, um, man, just to be able to sing songs to Jesus, man. Grateful to have him here to lead us. I want to just kind of do next level stuff with some of the songs that we sing because um, there's some things in there that may be confusing to you, and if I could just quick clear them up and it'll add value to your life. So I'll go back to that one song that says, I am a child of God. There's this line in that song that says, you split the sea so I could walk right through it. Now, if you're familiar with Scripture, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, that actually has ties back to the book of Exodus. Because in the book of Exodus, God is liberating his people. He had a mountain in the wilderness, and in front of them was, was um, the Red Sea, and behind them was the Egyptian army. Well, God split the sea so that his people could walk right through it, because bearing down on them were the Egyptians. And the next line in that song says, you, you, or says, you split the sea so I could walk through it. Um, you drowned my fear in perfect love. Well, after the Israelites had made it uh, to the other side and they turn around and the Egyptian army is bearing down on them, the sea collapses on top of the Egyptians and God drowned their fear in perfect love. And then the next song says, you rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Now, you probably don't have Egyptians bearing down on you this morning. However, that doesn't mean that there's not something that's bearing down on you. God will split the sea so that you can walk right through it. He'll drown your fear in perfect love so that you can, he'll rescue you so that you can stand and sing, I am a child of God. And when you stand and sing, I am a child of God, who gets the glory? God gets the glory. Glory, hallelujah for that one. Okay, so we just sang that song, Oceans, man. And I know that, I know that a lot of us love that song, Oceans. And you take me out in the deep, you call me out upon the waters. Well, there, again, uh, it's got a lot of deep biblical and scriptural truth because there's this moment on the Sea of Galilee, a storm. Jesus had sent the disciples out, and, uh, and he, rather than just kind of walking out to them on, by land, he walks to them out on water, and he calls Peter to step out of the boat. Now, it's way too deep. Peter can't stand. The water's a lot deeper, and he calls him out into that very place where all he has is Jesus. And again, so when we sing these songs, man, these are the type of things. This is like when you sing these words, you're like, what do they mean? Well, they have deep spiritual references, where uh, biblical truths, where God is just inviting us into those very same things today. I'll tell you one more uh, piece of, well, I'll tell you a lot more about Scripture today. But uh, again, just, you know, sticking with uh, the Scripture of theme, I th uh, the Scripture theme, I think of um, that moment where Jesus took his disciples to a place called Caesarea Philippi. It was the pagan uh, worship epicenter of a god named Pan, and people went there to worship this false god. And it was believed that there was this, it, well, there was a hole in the wall that led to the underground, led to the underworld. In that part of the world, Caesarea Philippi actually believed that that was the gates of hell. Like, you, this was the gateway to hell. So where does Jesus lead his disciples? Not to a safe place. He takes them to the doorstep of hell, and if you're familiar with it, you finish it for me. He says, I'm going to build my church right here, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Jesus takes the fight to the, right to the enemy's doorstep and says, you can't stop me. You can't stop me. This past week, I was, uh, man, over the past 10 days, my life has been a whirlwind. I'll just let you know, I don't know whether I'm coming or going. My body is so confused. It doesn't know what time frame it's on. Uh, but 10 days ago, I, I went across, uh, if you're here for the first time, I went over to Lebanon, uh, as in Beirut, Lebanon, and they took me to the border. They took me to the Syrian border. So you could say that I was on the doorstep of the enemy. 
And right within a walk's distance, where the enemy can just walk over a hill and they're in Lebanon, right, right within spitting distance of the enemy, I'm here to tell you this morning as a witness that Jesus, who said, I will build my church at Caesarea Philippi at the gates of hell, he is building his church at the gates of the enemy, and there's nothing the enemy can do to stop it. Absolutely nothing. You see, in the, one of the largest refugee camps in all the land of Lebanon, God is building his church within a stone's throw of Syria. He's building his church right there. I sat in a tent with a refugee who obviously would not want to be there. They would not want to be there, and they were telling us this story. You say, how do you know what they were saying? I didn't have a clue. Thank God for translators. But this woman was sharing, I got a family of like seven kids. My husband's distraught. I don't want to be here. We don't, we don't like being here. And this is what the translator, his name is Bashir. This is what he said to him. He said, um, he said, um, Lord God, let this be okay that I'm saying this. Protect those workers there in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. He told, um, it's, uh, he told them, he told this woman, he goes, Jesus Christ knows what you're going through. He said he was a refugee too. And when he said to a refugee woman that Jesus knew her experiences because he was a refugee too, that connected with her. And it connected with me because I thought to myself, there is nothing that Jesus Christ experienced that, that doesn't translate to our lives. He's seen it all, he's been through it all, and he's conquered it all. He relates to us on every level, even the ones we don't think about. And yeah, you may not be a refugee here this morning, but he can relate to the trials and the tribulations and the struggles that you've gone through. And he has overcome, and because he is overcome, because he's overcame, if your, life in his, if your life is in his, then you too have overcome. Not through your power, but Jesus' power. And dude, we're just getting started. I sat in the tent. I sat in the tent um, with, uh, with a group of Iraqi refugees, and they weren't studying the Quran. You want to know what they, did, what they were studying? The Holy Bible. They get done with this Bible study, and they looked at me, and they said, man, you got to say something now. I said, awesome. I said, man, I got up, and this is what I said. He said, Lord, give me something to say, and this is what I said. I said, only God could bring Americans and Iraqis together in a peaceful situation. And I said, this may be the only time in my life that I am in this room with you worshiping God, but there will come a day where I will see you again face to face, and we will lift his name high, not in this room, but in his presence. And I cannot wait for that day. I'll see you then, brother. And so, listen, I'm just telling you. What God is doing on the other side of the pond is of biblical proportions. I would challenge you. I would encourage you. I would beg you to go home and read Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, like blessed are the poor in spirit for they will be comforted. I saw that in real life. And the same God who was at work over on that side of the pond while we were all sleeping is the same God who's wanting to do a work in and through your life today that you would stand bold and courageous and that you would stand fearlessly and that you would tell, um, that you would tell the world of God's love. I'll just tell you this one last thing about that trip because there will be more in weeks to come and I'll have pictures and things like that. But the, what a vision. What a vision. This guy, I, I won't say his name, but uh, what a vision. He says, I get up out of bed every morning and I share the gospel because the work that God has called me to do is to rebuild Syria. And I am rebuilding Syria from the inside out. I am sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And their grandparents might not go back. Their parents might not go back. When the, but when these kids in 10 to 15 years, that's how long this war is going to last. In 10 to 15 years, when these children go home and rebuild their country, they're going to do it with the love of God in their heart. How different is that than what's happening in the news right now? When, country is, when that country is rebuilt, it will be rebuilt with the love of God in their hearts. That is a vision. That is a reason to get out of bed every morning. That is a purpose. And we have the same purpose. We get to get out of bed and we get to rebuild our community. We get to rebuild our families. We get to rebuild our lives each and every day with the love of Jesus. Okay, so... Um, 
the reason we're here is uh, we're here to pursue God, and he's the focus, and we're in the middle of this study where we're talking about the good book, which is the Bible, and we've been looking at 40 chapters of God's word that are communicating the Bible's biggest ideas, and over the past two weeks, Justin talked about tough love and troubled times, and he did an awesome job. Last week, Harold talked about Jesus has now entered the building. When he said that, I just thought about Elvis for a minute. I was like, Elvis left the building, but Jesus came in the building. So that was a really cool thing. Jesus entered the building, and Harold, man, he did an awesome job. And we're going to build on that today because here is the big idea this week. The big idea, the first blank on your outline says this. It says that Jesus won't leave us as we are. Jesus won't leave us as we are. Let me tell you, like when I first read that, I was like, oh man, I could look at it from this angle. But I started looking at it from that angle. I said, man, that angle's incomplete. I was like, I got to look at it from this angle. And then you look at this, this from this angle. And then I looked at it, I was like, well, that's only partial truth. All to say, you guys, Jesus won't leave us as we are is a really, really, really big deal. There are so many different angles we can look at it. Just, just, we'll just try this one on. You guys see, when you guys woke up this morning, uh, and we're going to have somewhere between 70,000 thoughts uh, by, the t- uh, by the time today comes to an end. That's a lot of thoughts, isn't it? A lot of thoughts. Some of you guys, when you woke up this morning, you were thinking about that brand new boyfriend or that brand new girlfriend. Or you were thinking about that brand new spouse. Or you were thinking about that upcoming wedding. And are you thinking about that baby that's going to be born pretty soon? Or maybe that baby that was just delivered. Maybe you're thinking about that job promotion that that you didn't have last week, but you got it now. And that's God's goodness in your life. You see, he didn't leave you as you are because you were something. You were somewhere before that. And God took you from there to here. Jesus won't leave you as you are. But with 70,000 thoughts that are going to go through our lives, and with this many people in the room, I know that this morning not everything is like a ray of golden sunshine. Like for some of you, you came in and you're dealing with some heavy, heavy stuff. Like you might feel depressed this morning. You might feel anxious this morning. Maybe it's relationships that are broken or fractured that are driving that. Maybe it's financial insecurities. Maybe it's marriage. There could be a whole nitty of reasons why you feel like, hey, I am in a season that I want out of as quick as I can get out of it. And the good news for you is Jesus won't leave you as you are. But if we were to, again, if we were to just look at it from a different angle, we say, well, some of these things are physical and emotional and things like that. Well, if we look at Jesus won't look at us or leave us as we are, that has big time spiritual implications for us. In fact, I would say that this piece of it tips the scale the most. Because you see, what I would tell you is Jesus cares about your physical condition, so don't confuse this at all. He cares about that, but what he cares about more is your spiritual condition, the condition of your soul. And he wants to meet you, and he wants you to know that he loves you, and he will not leave you as you are. And what that means is, is you could be going through the hardest season of your life, and spiritually, he will not leave you as you are. He has the power to change your circumstances, but what he wants to change most is in here in how you see him because you can still walk through some deep weeds and still have joy in your heart, not by your strength, but by his strength living in you. You see, you might find yourself like, Lord, get me out of here, and you're praying the right prayer when you say, Lord, but the whole get me out of here is where it kind of takes a hard right. Just say, Lord, I need you, and he will teach you I won't leave you as you are. You see, this whole idea that Jesus won't leave us as we are is a really big deal. And there's something here for all of us this morning that is going to touch on that very point that is going to speak to your heart. And we're going to look at this awesome story. If you grew up in church, you have heard this story so many times. But I bet today, I believe today, at a minimum, you'll be reminded. But I think we're going to look at this story in a new way today because we're talking about Jesus won't leave us as we are. And Jesus is not going to leave the people in this story as they are. So with that being said, I want you to turn to your Bibles in Luke chapter 19. And we're going to read this story and we'll look at it and we'll just say, Lord, what do you want to do in our life? So uh, if you're joining us on screen, Luke chapter 19, if you're in here, open up your smartphone. 
open up your version app, or hey, listen, man, if you've got like the hardback co- copy, I know you can't see mine because it's camo, but it, it's there, and uh, you just open up your Bible, man. It's awesome. Luke chapter 19, let's read this thing together because Jesus isn't going to leave. After we read this passage today, Jesus isn't going to leave us as we are. He won't leave us as we are. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And a man was there by the name of, okay, awesome. Just wanted to make sure you're still with me. His name's Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector and he was, now he wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he runs ahead and he climbs a what tree? A sycamore tree to see Jesus since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached up his spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to, if you're online, they just said mutter. It was, they muttered, mutter. It was awesome. How many times could we mutter, mutter? Anyway, all right. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Now we're talking today how Jesus won't leave us as we are. And he's not going to leave anybody in this, in this story, in this encounter. He's not going to leave anybody as they are, whether they choose to see it. Whether they're able to see it or not, he's not going to leave anybody the same. Okay, where was Jesus at in this story? Just, you guys look at me, tell me, where was he at? He was Jericho. Do you know what the Jews thought about him being in Jericho? What are you doing, Jesus? What are you doing in Jericho? See, Jesus won't leave any of us the same. And by being and passing through Jericho, he is communicating that, yes, God, Israel, you are God's chosen people. You are his picture of to the you are his picture to the world of what it looks like to be in a right relationship with him. But uh, but Hebrew people, Jewish people, you need to understand that God's love is bigger than just you. He's not going to leave the people in Jerusalem as they are. The fact that he is there has people talking. He is expanding their understanding of God's love. For all people. They're like, what are you doing there, man? And he's like, I'm showing you how big God's love is. But there was a guy there, and his name was Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus didn't know Jesus. He didn't know, like he had heard of Jesus. And in fact, the reason that Zacchaeus wants to go out and see him is because just outside the walls of Jericho, Jesus had just healed a blind man. Now, if somebody heals a blind man off on 2nd Street, what are we going to do? We want to see what he looks like. Zacchaeus is out there for the exact same reason. He's not out there saying, oh, he's the son of God. He's not out there saying, oh, I believe in Jesus, so I'm going to go see him. He has got something going on in his life, and he takes a step towards Jesus. But Jesus is not going to leave Zacchaeus the same way he found him. In fact, he's going to lead him to a new and better life. But here's where this whole thing ties in together. There are some people in this room this morning that are just like Zacchaeus. You don't believe in Jesus. You're not here because you believe he's the son of God. You're not here because um, you believe all those things. Like Zacchaeus, you probably heard God loves you. Like Zacchaeus, you probably heard that Jesus loves you. The reason you're here today is like Zacchaeus. He had all the things that the world had to offer, and none of them was adding up. And he went out to see Jesus because he was hoping for something better and different. And you're here today because, man, you're hoping that God would meet you here today and offer you something new and better than what you currently have. And Jesus will not leave Zacchaeus 
as he is. How do I know that? Well, let's look at that story again because Jesus comes into town. Jesus comes into town and he doesn't stop to talk to the pastor. Jesus doesn't stop to talk to the person who never misses praying. Jesus doesn't stop to talk to the people that haven't missed church in a month. Who did he stop to talk to? Who did he stop to talk to? See, you said that, and, and here's how I know. Here's how I know this one's missed you. It's okay, it's missed me too. What did Jesus call him? What did, what did you, sorry, let me say this. What did Jesus say to him when he was up in the tree? He said, come down. But how did he, he, what did he say before that? What did he address this man as? By his name. He addressed Zacchaeus by his name. He would never met Zacchaeus before. He had never met Zacchaeus before. And he looks at that man in that tree and he knows him by name. He knows about his life and he invites him to come down and he invites himself over to go to his house. So if you came here today and you're not really convinced about Jesus, maybe you don't believe in Jesus, what I want to let you know is he is passing by your life right now. He knows your name and he knows you're here and he knows you're here to see him and today he wants to go home with you. He's inviting himself to be a part of your life. Now, Zacchaeus had to make a choice. He said, hey, he could have said no way. But he didn't say no way. He said gladly. And here is a life-changing principle for all of us. This is the next blank on your outline. A step towards Jesus is a step towards a new and better life. Zacchaeus took a step towards Jesus. Jesus won't leave him as he is, and it's going to absolutely transform his life. Absolutely transform his life. This morning, if you don't believe in Jesus, but you found yourself here at church, you have taken a step towards Jesus, and knowing Jesus and his love for you will change your life. You're 15 minutes away from a brand new life, and we are just starting. But Jesus won't leave us as we are, and there's a whole lot of different ways to look at that. And I want to look at verse 7 together because there's something in verse 7 that we all need to see. Verse 7, it says, the people saw, because Jesus goes and he's like, Zacchaeus, let's go, let's go to your house and let's have lunch together. And Zacchaeus is like, cool, and the crowd that's there, let's just read it together. All the people saw this. You see, Jesus just done a miracle. So the people outside of the city are now in the city. And the people now inside the city have heard what he did outside the city. And all of them are following Jesus. And they see that Jesus went with the tax collector. Not just any tax collector, but the chief tax collector. I mean, this dude is a bad guy. And what do they do? And the people saw this, and they began to, they began to say things like, I can't believe. He went to Zacchaeus' house because they don't want Jesus to hang from there. I can't, I can't, do you, do you see who he's going out to eat with? Do you see whose house he's going to? He's going over to Zacchaeus' house. They began to mutter. They began to mutter because they didn't understand. They didn't like it. But what they didn't understand is Jesus, while his attention is on Zacchaeus, has not forgotten about them because he is not going to leave them as they are. You see, he is expanding the picture and their understanding of how big God's grace is, how big his love is, how far his reach is. By Jesus going to Zacchaeus' house, he is shattering every mold of grace and God's love that they have ever experienced before. And what did they do? They muttered. They muttered, how dare Jesus do that? I thought he was a good guy. What's he doing? Here's a principle. Actually, before I tell you the principle, what has you muttered in your life? What has somebody done in Jesus' name that is not sinful, but it made you mutter? And let's not kid ourselves. We've done it. I've done it. Because we didn't have the understanding. We didn't have that knowledge. Like, what have you muttered about lately? Maybe, 
Maybe today, and you wouldn't want to say this publicly because you, because by goodness golly, we're in church and we don't want somebody to judge us. Uh, maybe when I talk to you about going over in Lebanon and I told you that what God's doing there, maybe that makes you want to mutter just a little bit. Because you look around here and you're like, there's a whole lot of work to do. Why on earth would you go across the ocean to go hang out with these people? Because God's love, or, love is bigger than just here. I had an opportunity to go, and I believe God cares about those refugees, so I went. But maybe the fact that I'm talking about that and not something else makes you want to mutter just a little bit. Maybe, maybe God has asked you in the past to abandon your plans and adopt his plans. Maybe you had this activity, maybe you had this thing lined up, but God had a divine appointment for you that day, and you knew that the Holy Spirit was saying, I want you to go and do this, and you said, no, I don't want to go because I already have this plan. And what did you start doing? You started muttering. Maybe you're seeing somebody get ahead at work when you've been busting your butt and nobody's seeing it, and you're like, God, when is it my turn and it's making you mutter? I got one for you. Harold just gave a killer announcement. He just said, dude, you know what we're going to do in a couple weeks here? We're going to go do an Easter egg hunt. What's Easter about? It's about who? It's about Jesus. How dare the church grab an Easter egg? That's sinful. Make, I, I promise you, there's somebody in here who muttered about that. Chris, Easter's about Jesus. You got an egg. Let me tell you something. Not because I'm saying we're going to do this, but because Jesus modeled it for us. Where is he in this story? He's not in Jerusalem, people. He's in Jericho where people need him most. We are not waiting for people to come here to tell them about Jesus. And you shouldn't either. We are going to go where they are. We are going to speak their language to share a timeless message. And I would tell you that if an Easter egg hacks you off, if it makes you want to mutter, we're just getting started. Why? Because lost people matter to God. Now, you matter to God, but Jesus left us, the 99, to go find the one. The one, all right? We will go. We will do bold, forward thinking. I'm thinking about Barb. I'm looking at Barb. I'm looking at Masha. I'm looking at Dwayne. Do you want to know why we have a special needs ministry? Because we will go to them so that we can share the love of Jesus, remove as many obstacles as we can. That's what we're called to do. And Jesus is doing this for this crowd. And what they don't even get at the moment is he's not leaving them as they are. He leaves them muttering, but he knows sooner or later Holy Spirit will work on their hearts and he'll open their eyes. So here is the life. I would just ask you one more time. What are you muttering about? What's got you muttering here is a principle to change your life. I think it's like the third blank on the outline. A mutter is the first step towards God doing a new work in your life. If you are muttering about something, it's because you don't see. It's because you don't understand. And if it's not sinful, stop muttering and say, God, how can I see a bigger picture of your love and your grace and your mercy? Because that's what he's trying to show us. And here's what I want you to know. It is so much bigger than Mike Fackler understands because I still mutter. It's bigger than I get. I won't know it in its totality until I'm in heaven and neither will you. So we're going to mutter, and that's not a bad thing if it points us to Jesus and if he won't leave us as we are. If he'll expand our understanding of who he is, how big his love and his grace and his mercy. Because when that love comes flooding into our lives, it changes us from the inside out. Jesus won't leave us as we are. He didn't leave the crowds the way that they were. When they muttered, he's like, I'm trying to show you something here. Now I want to go back to Zacchaeus because Jesus isn't going to leave Zacchaeus as they are. You know, if you're familiar with the Bible, if you're really familiar with your Bible, you know that in most Bibles, like the red lettering in the New Testament are actually the words that Jesus spoke. But as we read Luke 19, 1 through 10, you're not going to see red letters during that lunch. We see Zacchaeus going in a selfish man. We see Zacchaeus going in a sinful man to this lunch. We see Zacchaeus going in a broken man, but something happens in that lunch, and he comes out different. Look at, I think it's verse 8. This is how he comes out. 
But Zacchaeus all of a sudden stands up. He says, "Look, Lord, here I am now. Here, here now. I'm going to give half. Here and now, I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'm going to pay back four times the amount." Listen, what happened to Zacchaeus? Jesus happened to Zacchaeus. What happened to him? Like, what did Jesus say to him? Like, you've got to ask yourself the question, what would make somebody like me? Because we're all rich beyond measure. What would make somebody like me want to give half of my worldly possessions away to the poor? What would make somebody like me want to find everybody and anybody I've ever wronged and ask forgiveness, seek forgiveness, and pay retribution for how I had wronged them. What would make somebody want to do something like that? I would tell you, Jesus. We get the answer. We, we know what happened during lunch because of who Zacchaeus was. He was a chief tax collector, which means he made his wealth stealing from the poor. That doesn't earn you a good reputation. It will earn you a reputation, but not a very good one. They called that brother everything but Zacchaeus. And with passion and with energy, they spit at him. They didn't like him. Now, Jesus could have looked at that tree and said, Zacchaeus, hey, you come down from that tree because I got a message for you. I want to tell you that God loves you. Now, that would have made the crowd go, whoa, and that would have made Zacchaeus go, huh? But instead, Jesus says, I'm going to come to your house today. I could tell you that God loves you. I could tell you I love you, but I'm going to show you I love you. And then he goes and he has something there. Zacchaeus knows he's not worthy to have. He doesn't know anything about Jesus other than he does miracles. He knows he's not worthy to have Jesus Christ in his house. He knows that he doesn't deserve. He knows he's the most undeserving guest out of all the people there. You don't have to tell him that. And it blows his ever-loving mind that Jesus Christ is in his house. See, what that does is it doesn't leave him as he is. It communicates communicates to him, I love you, Zacchaeus. And when during that lunchtime, Zacchaeus walks in there thinking, man, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm that. And Jesus says, no, Zacchaeus, God loves you, and that's why I'm here. And he says, Zacchaeus, God wants you to know him. He loves you. That was probably one of the first times in that brother's life that somebody says, I love you. I see all your brokenness, and I love you. I see how you're broken. I see how you're sinful, and I love you. And the message, and it changed that who Zacchaeus was. He's like, you know who I am, and you're telling me you love me? Oh, baby. you God, I'm telling you who Mike Fackler is, and you love me? I am unworthy. No, fear and terror. God knows who you are, and he loves you. I would tell you that you're unworthy, but he gives it to us anyway, and he doesn't leave Zacchaeus as he is. And here's the last thing. Here's the last point on your outline. You better put it up there because I I remember part of it, but not all of it. Knowing Jesus produces a crazy love. Knowing that God loves you, knowing him, not knowing about him because Zacchaeus went in knowing about him, but now he comes out knowing him. And after Jesus says, I love you, here Jesus, uh, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I love you. And then he says, you know, Zacchaeus, I care an awful lot about the poor. I care about the poor. And Zacchaeus is saying, if you love me and you love the poor, because you love the poor and you love me, I will love the poor too, Jesus. And I will right now serve up half of my worldly possessions. And he had a bunch. I'll give right here, right now, half my possession. He woke up stealing from the poor. And now all of a sudden he's running around giving to the poor here and now. He's like, here, you need this. Here, you need this. Hey, man, I, I think I stole from you. Here, you need this. Hey, man, would you please forgive me? Here's four times. Do you want to know what those people thought about Zacchaeus? They thought he was crazy. They thought he'd lost his ever-loving mind. They're like, what happened to you? What happened to you in there? Did you get a hold of some bad hummus or what? What happened to you, man? Jesus happened to me. Because my whole life I thought this is who I was, but God told me this is who I am. And that changed me. He told me that he cares for you. I am sorry I've been stealing for you. I'm sorry that I own this stuff. This is actually not my stuff. This is your stuff because I overtaxed you last week. Here you go. Take it home. Sell it. What? 
Now all of a sudden people are looking around and they're looking at Jesus differently because he's not leaving anybody different once he meets them. And I'm hoping like crazy this morning that if you came here seeking or if you're stuck in a rut, that today Jesus won't leave you as you are. That with the same passion, the same intensity, the same determination that your life would look absolutely crazy to anybody who would know you because of the love of God that lives in you and because you care about the poor and because you love the kingdom and because you love Jesus because he's made such a difference in your life. So this morning... Whether you're just taking a step towards Jesus, I'm going to ask you to seal the deal. I'm going to ask you to know him because he wants to go home with you. And here's how you know him. You acknowledge that you're a sinner. So in the, in the privacy of your own chair, teenagers, don't miss this. This is a big deal. In the privacy of your own heart, your mind not going to ask you to stand just say, Jesus, I want you to come home with me today. Tell him why you're unworthy. He already knows. In the quietness of your heart and your mind, you thank him for, your, for his love for you. Thank him. Say, Jesus, thanks for loving me. I want that love more than I want anything else. This is a big part. You've got to confess it. You've got to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died on the cross, he rose from the dead so that you could have life. Confess that with your mouth. Believe in your hearts that it's real. Welcome to the kingdom of God. He's going home with you for lunch today. Your life will never be the same. Your life will never be the same. And I'm going to ask you before you go, there's a card in your seat back. we got to know this. There's a card in your seat back that says, I gave my life to Jesus. Fill that out. When we're done, I'm going to ask you to go to the place and just hand it to him. We'll call you. We'll call you. Don't worry. We won't lock you down in a long conversation. But we want to help you grow. We want to help you get around other like-minded people so you can continue to experience the goodness of Jesus. So if you took a step towards Jesus today, I want to say thanks for going all the way. You just changed the course of your life. Not just here and now, but eternally. It's awesome for everybody else. Maybe, maybe, maybe you didn't need to take that step today. Maybe you've been muttering. You've been muttering, Jesus doesn't want to leave you as you are. Ask him to expand your understanding of his goodness, his grace, and his love. Will you pray with me? Lord God, you are good. Not everything that happens to me is good, God. It doesn't always feel good. But that doesn't mean that you can't work it out to where I praise you. So wherever we're at, whether we're stepping towards you, God, or whether we're muttering, I pray in the power of Jesus' name that you would work all things out for the good of those who love you, that we would see it and we would praise your name. Lord, I pray we would have a boldness this week. I pray that your love would radiate from our face, that it would radiate from our lives, that people would look at us and say, that, that person's crazy. I pray we wouldn't do it in a way that looks insane. I just pray we'd look, do it in a way that people see you. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.